we can start now. Um, thank you uh, once again. Uh, I would like to welcome to uh, the, fifth, the fifth day of the 66th ordinary session of the Commission uh, to all state delegates um, who have joined us uh, today. Um, to representatives of national human rights institutions, representatives of international organizations, uh, representatives of civil society organizations, uh, distinguished participants, you are very welcome. Uh, and we are happy to have you for this fifth day of the public session of the 66th ordinary session. Uh, today, we would uh, have uh, we have a request from uh, a state party. Um, I'm not really sure if we have uh, the representative of the state of Eritrea, uh, Mr. Bin Binyam Berhe. Um, if we have uh, Mr. Binyam Berhe with us, um, we will give the floor to Mr. Binyam Berhe. Uh, a representative of the state of Eritrea, um, head of delegation of permanent mission to the African Union and UNEC for uh, Africa. Looks like that we don't as yet have uh, Mr. Biniam Berhe with us. Um, so let me actually run through the agenda for today. Uh, today, uh, we will be uh, considering uh, the applications for observer status um, for which uh, the, all the requirements uh, have been uh, provided to the Commission. Uh, and there are three applications in this respect, uh, applications uh, from uh, Togo applications, uh, an application from Uganda, another application from Kenya. Uh, before we review uh, these applications uh, in accordance with uh, the resolution of the Commission uh, on the criteria uh, for observer status of non governmental organizations with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, uh, we will be uh, presenting uh, two documents on the cooperation uh, between the Commission and national human rights institutions, uh, and another one on the cooperation between um, the Commission and non-governmental organizations. As all of you uh, may know, under, African under Article 45 of the African Charter, uh, provision is provided for the Commission to establish close working relationship uh, with uh, organizations working in the field of human rights. It is within that framework that we will be uh, presenting these uh, documents. Um, once we have uh, these documents, we will go back to item uh, three uh, on the situation of human rights in Africa uh, with a focus on human rights in the context of COVID-19. Uh, there are a list of uh, requests for presenting statements. So we will revert back to item three once we have exhausted the items that I have uh, uh, listed as agenda for uh, today's session. Um, we will start with presenting the paper on cooperation with national human rights institutions. Uh, and this will be presented by uh, uh, Honorable Commissioner Maya Sahli Fadel. Uh, since there are no uh, requests for, uh, for requests for affiliate status from national human rights institutions. Thereafter, we'll proceed to the next paper. So, Commissioner Maya, uh, if you are ready, uh, oui. 
Merci, ah. Monsieur le Président. Bonjour, euh, honorable commissaire. Bonjour, honorable représentant des États, des INDH, des organisations non gouvernementales. Bonjour aux membres du secrétariat, également les interprètes et le personnel technique. Donc, conformément au point 6, je vais vous présenter l'état des relations et coopérations entre la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples et les institutions nationales des droits de l'homme et institutions spécialisées en Afrique. L'article 26 de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples demande aux États partis de permettre l'établissement et le perfectionnement d'institutions nationales appropriées chargées de la promotion et de la par ailleurs, l'article 45 demande notamment à la Commission de coopérer avec les autres institutions africaines ou internationales. Dans cette perspective, la Commission a formalisé ses relations avec de telles institutions par l'octroi du statut de membre affilié. La règle 71 alinéa 1er du règlement intérieur, nouvellement adopté en juin 2020, dispose les institutions nationales des droits de l'homme et les institutions spécialisées des droits de l'homme en Afrique créées par les États partis et fonctionnant conformément aux normes et standards internationaux et régionaux reconnus peuvent se voir accorder le statut d'affilié auprès de la Commission. Outre les avantages liés à l'octroi du statut de membre affilié auprès de la Commission, notamment l'invitation aux sessions de la Commission et la participation sans droit de vote aux discussions sur les questions qui les intéressent, la résolution sur l'octroi du statut d'affilié aux institutions nationales des droits de l'homme et aux institutions spécialisées dans la défense des droits de l'homme en Afrique adopté lors de la 60e session ordinaire de la Commission, tenue en mai 2017, stipule ce qui suit. Je cite, « Les institutions nationales et autres institutions spécialisées dans la défense des droits de l'homme, jouissant du statut d'affilié, ont les responsabilités suivantes. Tout d'abord, elles assistent la Commission dans la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme au niveau national. » Elle, elle présente leur rapport d'activité à la Commission tous les deux ans. Jusqu'à la 65e session ordinaire tenue en novembre 2019, le statut de membre affilié auprès de la Commission a été accordé à 29 institutions nationales. Au cours de la période d'intercession, précédant le début de la 66e session ordinaire, le 13 juillet 2020, la Commission n'a reçu aucun rapport d'activité des INDH et institutions spécialisées qui jouissent actuellement du statut d'affilié. Et également, aucune demande d'obtention de ce statut n'a euh, pu être déposée devant la Commission. À cet égard, la Commission voudrait noter que la règle 71 alinéa 2 du règlement intérieur de 2020 prévoit que, je cite, les institutions ayant le statut d'affilié auprès de la Commission jouissent des droits et remplissent les obligations définies dans sa résolution subventionnée. Comme il a été indiqué, l'un des devoirs de chaque INDH et institution spécialisée jouissant du statut d'affilié est de soumettre un rapport d'activité à la Commission tous les deux ans. L'état de soumission des rapports d'activité à la Commission par les INDH et les institutions spécialisées se présente comme suit. Je cite, « Rapport soumis avant la 64e session ordinaire, tenu en mai 2019. Aucun rapport n'est dû pour la Commission nationale sahraoui des droits de l'homme, République arabe sahraoui démocratique, pour le Conseil national des droits de l'homme concernant la République algérienne, la Commission nationale des droits de l'homme de la République démocratique du Congo. Statut de membre affilié accordé lors de la 63e session ordinaire tenue en novembre 2018 avec le premier rapport dû en novembre 2020, nous avons la Commission des droits de l'homme du Soudan du Sud. Les institutions nationales 
suivantes des droits de l'homme ayant un rapport en souffrance ou plus sont les suivantes. La Commission for Gender Equality, République d'Afrique du Sud. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Rwanda. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme de Côte d'Ivoire. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Nigeria. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Kenya. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Mali. La Commission nationale des droits humains du Niger. La Commission sud-afrique. Oui. La Commission des droits de l'homme de l'Ouganda. The Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice of Ghana. C'est-à-dire la, la Commission des droits de l'homme et de la justice administrative du Ghana. La Commission nationale pour la démocratie et les droits de l'homme de la Sierra Leone. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme et de la bonne gouvernance de la Tanzanie. Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Togo. Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Tchad. Commission des droits de l'homme de l'Éthiopie. Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Burkina Faso. Le Comité sénégalais des droits de l'homme. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme et des libertés du Cameroun. La Commission nationale des droits de l'homme de Mauritanie. Commission nationale des droits de l'homme de Zambie. Commission nationale des droits de l'homme de Maurice. Commission nationale des droits de l'homme du Soudan. Et Commission nationale indépendante des droits de l'homme du Burundi. Et enfin, la Commission des droits de l'homme du Zimbabwe. Comme il ressort de cette compilation, 25 institutions nationales des droits de l'homme n'ont pas soumis un ou plusieurs rapports d'activité à la Commission. En conséquence, la Commission exhorte les institutions spécialisées jouissant du statut d'affilié à lui soumettre une obligation stipulée dans le règlement intérieur et dans la résolution subventionnée. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Meyer, uh, for presenting uh, this update uh, report on the status of relationship between the Commission and national human rights institutions with affiliate status uh, before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And I would like to uh, join Commissioner Meyer in urging uh, those national human rights institutes uh, that, that didn't submit their report uh, as per the applicable rules of the Commission uh, to make the submission of their reports. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Commissioner Maya. As I indicated earlier on, we didn't receive applications requesting affiliate status with, before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights uh, from any national human rights uh, institution. Uh, but we would uh, wish to urge uh, states parties to the African Charter uh, whose uh, national human rights institutions do not have affiliate status uh, to send applications for affiliate status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Next is the paper on cooperation with non-governmental organizations and uh, this update uh, report on the relationship with non-governmental organizations with observer status before the African Commission is to be presented by Honorable Commissioner Maria Teresa Manuela. Commissioner Manuela, you have the floor. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Sr. Presidente. Mais uma vez, bom dia, caros colegas. Bom dia a todos os presentes. Irei apresentar a relação de cooperação entre a Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos e as organizações não governamentais. A linha C do número 1 do artigo 45 da Carta Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos mandata a Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos a cooperar com outras instituições africanas e internacionais interessadas em promover e proteger os direitos humanos e dos povos. As organizações não governamentais desempenham um papel de relevo. Apologies, Commissioner Manuela. Apologies. Uh, we don't have 
the English. Okay, we can hear you. Thank you. Please proceed, Commissioner Manuela. Possible? Okay. que a linha C do número 1 do artigo 45 da Carta Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos, mandata a Comissão Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos a cooperar com outras instituições africanas e internacionais interessadas em promover e proteger os direitos humanos e dos povos. As organizações não governamentais desempenham um papel de relevo nas atividades da Comissão, especificamente contribuem para uma maior tomada de consciência sobre violações dos direitos consagrados na Carta Africana, tomam a iniciativa de apresentar queixas à Comissão Africana em nome de indivíduos, fiscalizam o cumprimento das decisões por Estados-partes e ajudam a popularizar a Comissão Africana, organizando conferências, seminários e outras atividades. Face ao papel significativo desempenhado por, pelas ONGs na promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos e dos povos em África, a Comissão formalizou o seu relacionamento com essas ONGs mediante a atribuição do Estatuto de Observadoras. Tal como pormenorizado no capítulo 2º da Resolução sobre Critérios para Concessão e Manutenção do Estatuto de Observadoras, a organizações não governamentais que trabalham na área dos direitos humanos e dos povos em África, adotada durante a 59ª sessão ordinária em novembro de 2016, as ONGs com estatuto de observadoras são convidadas a participar em sessões da comissão, podem ter acesso a documentos que não estejam com a natureza confidencial e têm a oportunidade de proferir declarações sobre assuntos do seu interesse durante as sessões públicas. Dado que a concessão do Estatuto de Observadoras insere-se no âmbito de uma relação recíproca, o capítulo 3 da resolução sobre as, as relações entre a Comissão e as Observadoras estipula que os observadores apresentarão os seus relatórios de atividades à Comissão de dois em dois anos. Assim, as ONGs com estatuto de observadoras devem apresentar relatórios de atividades à comissão de dois em dois anos, fornecendo pormenores das atividades que realizaram. Até a 65ª sessão ordinária, realizada em novembro de 2019, 523 ONGs haviam obtido o estatuto de observadoras junto da comissão. Durante o período entre sessões, Antes do início da 66ª sessão ordinária, a 13 de julho de 2020, oito ONGs adiante indicadas apresentaram os respectivos relatórios de atividades ao secretariado da comissão. São elas o Instituto dos Direitos Humanos e Desenvolvimento em África, com o número 231, Projeto de Defensores dos Direitos Humanos do Leste de África, com o número 359, Iniciativa para os Direitos Econômicos e Sociais, com o número 490, Fórum da Consciencialização e Promoção dos Direitos Humanos, com o número 496, Organização Internacional de Advogados, com o número 482, Associação de Apoio aos Prisioneiros da Nigéria, com o número 461, Associação de Azairuna, com o número 487, e a Comunidade de Ceramistas do Ruanda, com o número 378. Até a presente data, das 523 organizações não governamentais com estatuto de observadoras, 352 apresentaram um ou mais relatórios das suas atividades. A Comissão gostaria de agradecer essas organizações não governamentais por terem cumprido o requisito de apresentação de relatórios de atividades e aproveita a oportunidade para convidar todas as ONGs que usufruem dos benefícios do Estatuto de Observadoras a apresentar tais relatórios de forma consistente à comissão, de dois em dois anos, em conformidade com o requisito estipulado na pertinente resolução supracitada. A comissão apela a todas as ONGs que trabalham em matéria de direitos humanos em África e, asso e associações profissionais que auxiliam na promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos no continente 
que se candidatem ao Estatuto de Observador para, de forma coordenada com os demais atores, servir a causa comum, pois os direitos humanos são uma responsabilidade coletiva. Muito obrigada, senhor presidente, e tenho apresentado o relatório da nossa relação de cooperação com as organizações não governamentais. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Manuela, uh, for this update report on uh, the status of the relationship between the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and non-governmental organizations with observer status uh, before the Commission. Uh, I also wish to join Commissioner Manuela in urging uh, non-governmental organizations with observer status that didn't uh fulfill uh the reporting requirements uh to uh fulfill the reporting requirements as per the resolution of the commission on the observer status of non-governmental organizations uh, i also wish uh, to thank those who have fulfilled this requirement of reporting to the commission thank you commissioner manuela once again uh, now we would uh proceed to consider applications for observer status. Uh, and in this regard, as I pointed out at the start of our session, uh, the first application is uh, from Togo uh, and the country reporter for uh, Togo, uh, Vice Chairperson Commissioner Remy uh, Ngoilumbu uh, will present uh, the review of the application for observer status. Vice Chairperson, you have the floor. <coughs> Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Honorable Commissaire, uh, uh, bonjour. Je vous remercie pour la parole que vous m'accordez. Après avoir entendu l'état de la coopération entre la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples et les INDH, ainsi qu'entre la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples et les ONG, rapport qui n'est pas, de mon point de vue, euh, fameux, au regard des obligations euh, qui incombent aussi bien aux INDH aux organisations de la société civile de devoir soumettre sur une base bisannuelle leur rapport. Je voudrais maintenant présenter à l'intention de la commission pour décision la demande du statut d'observateur du centre de documentation et de formation sur le droit de l'homme. C'est une pratique au sein de la Commission que ces gens de demande puissent être présentés aux honorables commissaires par les rapporteurs pays. Le centre de documentation et de formation sur le droit de l'homme, le CDFDH, est une ONG togolaise dont les sièges est établi au Togo, sur la rue des Tech, je pense dans la commune de Béklikame, au numéro 1441. Ce centre est une organisation non gouvernementale établie par le droit togolais pertinent, fondée le 25 mai 2017, à Lomé et enregistré sous le numéro 077 52 33 du 17 juillet 2017 au ministère de l'administration territoriale et de la décentralisation et des collectivités locales. Il s'agit de ce qu'on appelle communément une association sans but lucratif ou à but non lucratif. C'est une association politique 
Sa demande a été introduite le 17 juillet 2019. Vous savez que l'une des conditions d'octroi du statut d'observateur a toujours été que les objectifs que poursuivent les organisations non-gouvernementales non puissent être conformes puisse être conforme à l'article 45 de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples. Et si vous avez examiné le dossier, vous vous êtes sans doute rendu compte qu'elle a pour objectif de fournir aux acteurs des droits de l'homme, les acteurs étatiques ou non étatiques, des formations pratiques sur les droits de l'homme. De notre point de vue, ça cadre avec l'article 45.1 de la Charte, c'est une activité qui participe de la promotion des droits de l'homme. Cet ONG a également pour objectif de contribuer au renforcement des capacités de la société civile en général et des défenseurs des droits de l'homme en particulier. Il nous semble que le renforcement des capacités est également une activité qui participe à de la promotion des droits de l'homme. En troisième lieu, l'objectif de cette organisation, c'est de rendre disponibles les ressources documentaires utiles au travail des défenseurs des droits de l'homme. Ici aussi, nous sommes dans la droite ligne, dans le champ de l'article 45.1 de la Charte. Enfin, l'ONG poursuit pour objectif d'informer les acteurs des droits de l'homme sur les opportunités de formation en matière des droits de l'homme et d'intégration des réseaux offerts par les institutions. Et pour terminer, offrir un appui technique aux institutions de la République en vue de conformer les cadres légaux et institutionnels de promotion et de protection des droits de l'homme au Togo aux bonnes pratiques et aux standards Internationaux. Tous ces objectifs, de notre point de vue, participent de la philosophie de l'article 45 de la Charte. Vous verrez que dans la liste des documents vous soumis, il y a non seulement, je pense que tous les commissaires ont eu le dossier qui nous a été envoyé par Internet, une lettre de demande de statut d'observateur formulé par les animateurs de cette ONG, la liste des responsables des différents organes de, 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 de l'ONG, la preuve matérielle de son existence juridique, les statuts et règlements intérieurs de cette ONG, les sources de financement figurent également au dossier, et l'ONG a également soumis son dernier rapport d'activité avant qu'il ne puisse saisir votre commission. Il figure également au dossier le dernier état financier par un cabinet d'audit, un cabinet assermenté qui contrôle le compte public de cette organisation, ainsi qu'un plan stratégique en cours d'exécution. Nous avons lu l'intégralité du dossier et voici les résultats que nous en avons tirés. Les objectifs du centre sont conformes à la charte, spécialement l'article 45 qui énumère les mandats de la Commission africaine de droits de l'homme et des peuples. Tout à l'heure ce matin, aussi bien l'honorable commissaire Manuela, que l'honorable commissaire Maya nous ont, ont partagé avec nous une partie du contenu de l'article 45 qui nous occupe également dans ce cadre. Les activités du centre sont également conformes à la charte. Comme je le disais, il est versé au dossier un rapport d'activité pour l'exercice 2017-2018. Nous avons lu ce rapport d'activité qui montre clairement que ce centre fait de la formation en organisant des séminaires, des colloques 
et des conférences pour renforcer les capacités des défenseurs de droits de l'homme et les organisations de la société civile togolaise. Troisièmement, cette structure, comme nous avions dit, elle est apolitique, mais elle œuvre dans le domaine de droits de l'homme. Son article 2 indique bel et bien qu'il s'agit d'un pool de référence en matière de formulation de propositions de qualité pour obtenir des changements dans tous les domaines de l'homme. Vous allez lire l'article 4 de ces statuts. Les ressources financières de l'organisation sont indiquées également au dossier. L'ONG a indiqué qu'en tant que structure à but non lucratif, elle fonctionne grâce aux cotisations de ses membres, aux droits d'adhésion, aux intérêts perçus sur le placement, les dons, les legs, les souscriptions volontaires des membres, les subventions et les revenus de ses activités. Elle indique également qu'elle bénéficie de l'appui financier des partenaires techniques et financiers comme OSIWA, que nous connaissons tous, le PNUD et le CCFD Terre solidaire. Au dossier figure une demande écrite qui a été scannée en PDF. Une lettre de demande des statuts d'observateur a été versée au dossier. Elle date du 10 juillet 2019, si je ne me trompe. Elle est signée par M. Godwin Koku Etse. Les statuts y sont versés au dossier du mal égalisé. Je parlais de la preuve de son existence juridique et vous verrez dans le dossier un bordereau établi le 13 juillet 2017 qui confirme l'organisation, l'enregistrement de cette organisation sous le numéro 576. Ce bordereau a été établi par la Direction des libertés publiques et des affaires politiques au sein du secrétariat général. Ce document suffit à lui seul pour opérer en toute légalité au niveau du Togo. La liste des membres est également une des pièces au dossier, exigée au dossier. Elle s'y trouve, elle comprend, elle indique clairement que l'organisation comprend deux membres au niveau de sa direction exécutive, dont M. Godwin qui a signé la lettre des demandes de statut d'observateur, et huit membres du conseil d'administration. Le bilan financier est également une exigence euh, au niveau de la commission, selon la résolution de 1999. Un rapport d'audit établi par MAC Inter Togo est versé au dossier. MAC Inter Togo est une société d'expertise comptable, d'audit et de formation des consultants. Cet audit couvre cette organisation non gouvernementale jusqu'à la période d'avant la saisine de votre commission pour la demande du statut d'observateur. Enfin, le mémorandum d'activité, il existe, voir son rapport d'activité dont je venais de parler tout à l'heure, mais ce rapport est complété par un plan d'action stratégique pour la période 2020-2021 que cette ONG est en train d'exécuter pour l'instant. Deux documents mettent en perspective les actions passées et celles projetées pour l'avenir par cette ONG, ce qui est une des exigences de la résolution. En conclusion, À la faveur de la demande de cette organisation qui a été présentée en 2019, et suite aux échanges de correspondances qui ont eu lieu entre le centre et le secrétariat pour compléter le dossier et obtenir des éclaircissements sur certains points, il apparaît de notre point de vue désormais que ce dossier contient toutes les informations requises par la Commission, conformément à la résolution de la Commission sur le poids du statut d'observation, d'observateurs adopté en 1999. Sur cette base, je propose que la Commission puisse accorder le statut d'observateur au Centre de documentation et de formation sur les droits de l'homme, le CDFDH en sigle. Je vous remercie pour la parole.
Thank you, uh, Vice Chair, for uh, presenting the uh, analysis on the application of uh, uh, for observer status of CDF DH with the Africa Commission on Human and People's Rights. Uh, as presented by the Vice Chair, uh, this um, organization uh, have uh, submitted all uh, the documentary requirements um, from application later to uh, a registration uh, before the appropriate national authority uh, for its legal existence, uh, the list of members, uh, statutes and rules of procedure of the organization, its source of funding, uh, the latest activity report, financial statement and strategic plan. Uh, and from the application, it is also clear that this is an organization based in Togo, which is a state party to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Uh, on the basis of the foregoing and having regard to the criteria uh, of the Commission's resolution on the granting of observer status uh, before the African Commission for NGOs, uh, the proposal uh, by the country reporter is for the Commission to adopt, to grant the observer status to CDFDH. So um, I am opening the floor uh, for members of the Commission. Uh, on the submission by the country reporter for the commission to grant observer status. Any observations? Colleagues, honorable members of the commission? Can I get an indication uh on whether you agree with the proposal for the commission to grant observer status please okay i see commissioner maya uh and commissioner manuela as well as commissioner guy uh, giving us a motion for granting observer status uh, to cdfdh uh, accordingly, the Commission has decided to grant observer status uh, to this uh, organization. Uh, we congratulate CDFDH for uh, having uh, an observer status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Thank you once again, Vice Chair. We now move to the next application. Uh, and this next application is uh, from uh, Uganda, as I indicated earlier on the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders uh, of Uganda. Uh, it would be Commissioner King uh, who would be uh, presenting this, um, the analysis and the proposal, uh, the proposed decision uh, on the application. Uh, this is, uh, so I, I would like, the, the, this is uh, Uganda, uh, the country reporter for Uganda is Commissioner Guy. But since the application is uh, in English, uh, we have arranged for this time uh, for Commissioner King to present this analysis uh, and the proposal on whether to grant observer status. Commissioner King, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. And good morning, everyone. This is an application for observer status from the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders, Uganda. This organization was registered on the 1st of March, 2018 in the Republic of Uganda. This organization, which is a national governmental, a non-governmental organization, <clears throat> National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders Uganda, NCHRDU, is a registered organization of various organizations and individual human rights defenders. 
It seeks to strengthen the work of human rights defenders throughout the country through synergy and collaboration at national and international levels to enhance the protection mechanism for human rights defenders and their capacity to effectively defend human rights. The objectives of this organization is one, to create an avenue for collective response to threats against human rights defenders, to coordinate other civil society organizations in promoting safety and security of human rights defenders, to improve protection mechanisms safety and security of human rights defenders in Uganda individually and security of human rights defenders in Uganda at an organizational level. To advocate and raise public awareness and profiles of human rights defenders in the country. The organization's vision and mission. The organization envisions a region in which the human rights and dignity of human rights defenders as stipulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights instruments are respected and upheld. Its mission is to protect and promote the work of human rights defenders in a safe and secure environment through linkages with national, regional and international like-minded entities. In support of this application for observer status, this organization has provided the commission with the following list of documents. One, a letter of application dated 4th February, 2019, list of members of the organization's board, the signed and authenticated statutes of the organization, certificate of its registration, sources of funding, independent audited financial statement for the year ended 31st December, 2018, consolidated annual report from 2016 to 2018, and its strategic plan from 2019 to 2021. This is the analysis of the Secretariat, which I endorse, that this application is from an organization whose main objectives and activities are in consonance with the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Having reviewed the document, we note that the application contains all the relevant documents as required under the Commission's resolution on the criteria for granting and enjoying observer status to NGOs working in the field of human and people's rights. I therefore recommend in view of the above that observer status be granted to the National Coalition for Human Rights Defenders, Uganda. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner King. Um, once again, um, in respect to this uh, application from the National Coalition of uh, Human Rights Defenders, Uganda, uh, the requirements as provided for in the Commission's resolution uh, on the granting of observer status for non-governmental organizations, uh, the various uh, documents uh, have been uh, analyzed, um, the legal status of the organization, uh, as well as uh, the, the fact that the, com the organization works in the field of human rights, uh, as specified not only in the resolution on the granting of observer status, but also under Article 45 of the African Charter, and the financial, uh, as well as other uh, requirements uh, in terms of documentation. And this is also an organization uh, based in Uganda. Uh, on that basis, the proposal uh, from uh, Commissioner King, uh, who reviewed this document, is that the Commission grants observer status to this non-governmental organization. Colleagues, your views. Chair. Yeah. Yes, yes, Commissioner uh, Wandek. I wanted to find yeah. out, because 
Did I hear correctly what the commissioner said that uh, the application was received in February 2019? Commissioner that's correct? Yes, that is correct. I wanted to find out why does it take so long for an application to be dealt with out of curiosity? That's all. Okay. Uh... Commissioner King, do you like to come in? Your mic is off, Commissioner King. Yes, thank you, Commissioner um, Modford, for that observation. Um, there are times when not all of the documents is supplied necessary for the granting of observer status. And there, it, it can only be considered during session. So if somebody submits an applicant submits documents this session and the documents are not complete, they will only be considered at the next session. And there's that time gap. And sometimes because of um, the failure to um, comply with all the requirements, it will only be presented to the commission when all the requirements are fulfilled. You would recall at the beginning of our session, um, questions were asked about some NGOs that have made this application for quite some time now, but because all of their documents have not been received in compliance with the resolution for the granting of observer status, it does take time. I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much uh, for that important question, Commissioner. Mandenga, uh, and also for um, the response from Commissioner King uh, explaining uh, in detail uh, why uh, it sometimes takes uh, some time to finalize the review process. Uh, I understand Vice Chair is uh, uh, moving uh, a motion for granting observer status, right? Your mic is off. Uh, no, par contre, uh, je n'ai pas vu le dossier physiquement, mais je voulais simplement me rassurer sur les objectifs que poursuit cette structure. Et si la commissaire uh, Jamsina peut nous les lire intégralement pour qu'on puisse uh, s'en imprégner. Parce que c'est une partie importante pour l'octroi du statut d'observateur. Avez-vous les objectifs, euh, si oui. vous pouvez nous les indiquer? Yes, I think I, I, I did read the ob objectives and they are... Just a second. The objectives are to create an avenue. It's first of all, it's a, it's um, 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 a coalition of various organizations and individual human rights defenders. It's a coalition and its objectives are to create an avenue for collective response to threats against human rights defenders. And Commissioner Lumbu, these are your, your, your um, 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 human rights defenders working with your mandate to coordinate other civil society organizations in promoting safety and security of human rights defenders, to improve protection mechanisms, safety and security of human rights defenders in Uganda, individually and collectively, and to advocate and raise public awareness and profiles of human rights defenders in the country. Thank you, Commissioner Remy, for that question. Okay, uh, Commissioner Remy is requesting for the floor once again. Commissioner Remy, you have. Justement, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Vous avez bien fait de mentionner le fait que je sois un rapporteur spécial en charge des défenseurs des droits de l'homme. Lorsque moi je lis ces objectifs. Bien qu'il s'agit de la défense des droits de l'homme, je n'arrive pas à les rattacher à l'article 45. 
quand je regarde les mots clés que vous avez invoqués, ce sont les menaces, la coordination du travail des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, les questions de sécurité des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, la sensibilisation du public sur le profil des défenseurs des droits de l'homme. Je suis rapporteur spécial pour les défenseurs des droits de l'homme, je ne refuse pas, mais je ne les rattache pas à l'article 45 à proprement parler. Je ne vois pas en quoi vous les rattachez à l'article 45. C'est pour ça qu'après vous avoir entendu, j'ai voulu reposer la question pour bien écouter quels sont les objectifs. En fait. Comment vous rattachez les menaces, la coordination du travail des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, la, sécur la sécurité, la sensibilisation je, je, je ne vois pas de lien direct avec l'article 45. C'est pour ça que je voulais vous poser la question, qu'est-ce que vous en pensez vous-même Uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair. Um, I don't know if uh, Commissioner King would like to step in now. Uh, otherwise, I have Commissioner Abomo, who also wished to intervene. Commissioner King, do you yes, like to I just wanted to say that the work they do as human rights defenders is to promote and protect human and people's rights, and as such. And basically under artic um, Article 45 of the Charter, that is the mandate that we also have. And we work with human rights organizations working in the field of human and people's rights. And so if you have somebody working in the field of human rights, I think their own protection, they not only protect the human rights of others, but we should also be concerned in the protection of human rights defenders. We have in the past as a commission received reports of, um, and these are allegations of threats, harassment, and even we've had situations where human rights defenders are killed. And if human rights defenders are not protected, they will not be able to promote and protect human rights. There are times when they even have to flee from their countries of origin, just so that their lives could be saved. So I would consider this to be a key element in the promotion and protection of human rights, which is safeguarding the life of human rights defenders. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner King. Uh, let me uh, uh, give the floor to Commissioner Abomo. Merci de me passer la parole, Monsieur le Président. Euh, je voudrais euh, être euh, rassuré sur ma compréhension de, de certaines dispositions de la résolution, parce que je lis dans le chapitre relatif aux conditions d'octroi que euh, l'ONG de Manderes doit produire euh, ces statuts signés et légalisés. Alors, ma question est celle-ci. S'agissant d'une coalition d'ONG, est-ce que euh, la même exigence doit euh, être faite à leur endroit, aux différentes ONG qui composent cette coalition? Est-ce que dans les pièces à produire, chacun, chacun des membres qui est une ONG doit produire son statut, ses statuts légalisés et signés? Voilà la question. Pour quelqu'un, nous devrions avoir ça dans le, le dossier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Commissioner Abomo. Uh, the, the, the question is, since this is a coalition uh, of different individual organizations, um, whether it is uh, a requirement for the commission to also have the individual uh, legal status uh, documentation of those individual members of the coalition. Uh, that is the question from uh, Commissioner uh, Abomo. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner King? Yeah, thank you very much, Commissioner Abomo, um, Abomo for that question. I'm looking at um, 
a document submitted by the organization. It has its members of in 2019. There are nine members and you have, each member has the organization they represent. And I'll just go through the organization so you know. Number one is chapter four, Uganda. And then there's another one, Tuana Ho Listeners Club. And then you have Lango Female Clan, Midwestern Anti-Corruption Coalition, Human Rights Center Uganda, Defenders Protection Initiative, Human Rights Network for Journalists, Defend Defenders, Uganda Law Society. These are the main nine members. They also have a technical thematic working group. And these members, their names are all listed. I just didn't want to call their names, but the organizations in the technical thematic working group is Women in Development Uganda, Umbrella Journalist of Kasesi, Navigators for Development Association, Barara Rise Foundation, and the fifth one is Batwa Development. So now you have about um, 14 organizations, and then they have regional representatives, which is Rights for Her Uganda Limited, Kalangala Human Rights Defenders, Bali Human Rights Defenders, Kakika Women's Group, and Life Concern, and these are five. So you have 14 and five, that's 19 organizations. That's 19 organizations. And their, their contact numbers are given, their email, we have their email, and the region and districts where they operate are all stated in the application. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner King, uh, for uh, providing the details of the membership of uh, the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders, Uganda, uh, and also um, uh, the fact that the uh, places uh, where these uh, members of the coalition work, 19 of them uh, work, uh, and the various constituencies that they represent, as well as their contact details, uh, as provided in the application. Um, I'm not sure uh, if we should immediately move to uh, make a decision uh, on the granting of the observer status of the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders Uganda uh, in the light of the questions that have been asked. Uh, my uh, proposal is that uh, let's, uh, I think, uh, check, particularly the question that Commissioner Abomo raised. Uh, I think those questions are um, important questions, perhaps, uh, for the Commission to um, satisfy itself uh, of uh, the issues raised, uh, and then uh, we will uh, be back uh, on uh, to, to make a determination uh, on the granting of observer status of the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders Uganda. Uh, I think out of abundance of caution, uh, it would be good uh, for the Commission uh, to uh, uh, fully satisfy itself on uh, responding to the questions that the Vice Chair as well as Commissioner Bomo raised. Uh, I think uh, with that, uh, we will therefore put on hold uh, this uh, application uh, for now. Uh, I think we will come back to it uh, in the course of today or uh, the latest by tomorrow. Okay, I see a hand. Uh, Commissioner Hatton. Yes, Commissioner Hatton. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président, mais il y a ma collègue Maya qui est avant moi. Je lui laisse la parole, je parlerai après. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, Sorry, Monsieur I didn't Atten. see Commissioner Maya. Good. Yeah. Commissioner Maya, you have the floor. And then Commissioner Hatton. Merci. Euh, pour abonder dans le même sens que la commissaire euh, Marie-Louise, est-ce que le secrétariat pourrait demander 
notamment à cette coalition, puisque le commissaire King a dit que cette coalition comporte 19 ONG. Elle est composée de 19 ONG. Est-ce que et nous avons les contacts Est-ce qu'on pourrait demander au secrétariat de s'adresser de manière individuelle à chaque ONG pour lui fournir également le, leur statut, c'est-à-dire est-ce que ce sont des ONG qui sont reconnues légalement, et également quel est l'objectif de ces ONG, pour ne pas tomber dans les travers que nous avons déjà connus hein, il y a de cela euh, deux, trois ans, euh, pour ne pas être surpris par l'action de certaines ONG. Donc, demander à ce que les 19 ONG qui composent actuellement cette coalition puissent nous fournir d'abord leur statut, donc euh, légalement, reconnus, et également les objectifs poursuivis. Merci. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Hatton. I just wanted to respond to Commissioner Meyer. So let me see. Commissioner King, uh, hold on, please. Uh, hold oh. on. Uh, the Commissioner Meyer's intervention was a proposal, actually. It was not really a question. So, uh, but, but I'll give you the floor, uh, Commissioner King. Uh, let me give the floor to Commissioner Hatam and then Commissioner King. Commissioner Hatam. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, moi, uh, je vais continuer dans le même fil du raisonnement uh, de notre collègue Marie-Louise et de la Commissaire Meyer. Moi, mon souci va. Uh, non seulement vers les objectifs des 19 composants de la coalition, mais au financement. Alors, je, ma question est la suivante. Comment est financée cette coalition Est-ce qu'on on nous a donné des documents qui prouvent le financement Est-ce que c'est des contributions des 19 membres ou bien il y a d'autres ressources de financement J'insiste sur ce, ce point-là pour euh, l'indépendance de la coalition. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Commissioner Hatton. Commissioner King. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Hatton and Commissioner Meyer for your questions. I think I want to first of all um, go to, I wanted to say that in their application, the areas in which they work, they have set that out for each organization and the work, they, the areas in which they work have been set out, that could be made available to commissioners. And then with respect to um, sources of funding, um, I'm just looking for the document, please bear me. They have a letter indicating sources of funding and going through it quickly, they have indicated that they receive fund from Fund for Global Human Rights, Democratic Governance Facility, UG, and Royal Netherlands Embassy through Eastern Horn Defend Defenders Project. And these funds is what they use for their activities in the past years. They have indicated that as well. Yes, uh, so that has been indicated. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner King, for the additional uh, uh, information uh, that you have put forward. Um, I proposed earlier, if, if there are no other members of the commission who would wish to take the floor. Um, I don't see any other member of the commission who would wish to, okay, I see the vice chair raising the hand. Yes, please. President, merci pour la parole. Je voudrais insister sur cette question des objectifs. J'ai été complété par les deux collègues, les trois collègues qui sont, qui ont pris la parole. L'octroi du statut d'observateur s'est fait conformément à l'article 45. Et l'article 45, c'est ça, les objectifs d'abord de la Commission. Les autres aspects qui proviennent des résolutions sont 
des objectifs complémentaires. Euh, les menaces, la coordination du travail des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, la sécurité, la sensibilisation du public sur le profil des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, ça reste des tâches nobles. La Commission protège bien évidemment tous les défenseurs des droits de l'homme. Mais pour l'octroi du statut d'observateur, on reste dans le cadre de l'article 45. Il faut affirmer noir sur blanc promotion et protection des droits de l'homme d'abord. Je ne nie pas le travail des défenseurs des droits de l'homme. Il faudrait qu'on le dise clairement. Alors, il faudrait que, dans l'analyse qui va être faite par après, même si ces objectifs existent, qu'on nous rassure. Par rapport à l'article 45, c'est vraiment important. Avant d'analyser même les objectifs de chaque organisation, parce qu'on peut être surpris, comme dit la commissaire Maya, il faudrait déjà à l'avance que nous sachions que cette coalition poursuit la formation de la protection des droits de l'homme. Parce que les droits de l'homme, il y en a beaucoup, et la défenseur des droits de l'homme, il y en a dans tous les secteurs. Vous savez, vous et moi, qu'il y a certains aspects qui posent problème sur les questions de promotion et de protection. Je voudrais m'arrêter là, mais l'essentiel pour moi, c'est celui de savoir simplement que nous devons nous rassurer de la conformité de tout ça par rapport à la philosophie que nous avons toujours utilisée depuis tout ce temps. Merci, Président. Je vous retourne la parole. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, very well noted. Uh, it is uh, in the light of all of these uh, considerations that I proposed earlier that uh, we will put on hold uh, the decision on the granting of observer status of uh, the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders Uganda uh, in order to uh, clarify uh, all the issues that members of the Commission raised and satisfy um, the Commission that all the conditions as provided for in Article 45 of the Charter and the resolution on the granting of observer status for non-governmental organizations are duly fulfilled. Uh, so uh, we will, for now, uh, suspend uh, this, uh, the consideration of this application. Uh, so thank you. Um, we will accordingly uh, go back and review uh, this, uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's proceed to the next application. Uh, the next application is uh, from the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness, C-R-E-A-W. Uh, and this would be presented by Commissioner uh, Kaitesi, uh, who have uh, agreed uh, to uh, present the review and analysis of uh, this application, uh, which is uh, from an organization based in Kenya, uh, for which I am the country reporter. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Kaitese. Uh, please take the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Bonjour, euh, distingué délégué. Euh, J'espère que je vais pouvoir présenter euh, cette application. J'ai un peu des problèmes de connexion, mais j'espère que ça ira. Uh, this is an application from uh, an ONG called the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness, C-R-E-A-W. It's a, a Kenyan organization. Uh, it has uh, registered uh, on 12 January 2012 in Kenya and uh, is based in Kenya too. Uh, the Center for Human Rights Education and Awareness is a, a feminine non-government non organization whose vision is a just society where women and the girls enjoy full rights and uh, 
life in dignity. Um, the mission of uh, this organization is to champion, expand, and uh, actualize women's and girls' rights and uh, social justice. Its objective is to promote, protect, and uh, women's and girls' rights and the freedoms as a of addressing prevailing systematic gendered inequalities, oppression, exploitation, and uh, discrimination. Uh, this organization provided different documents for application for observer status, including a letter of application a certificate of registration of 12th January 2012, a list of members of the board of directors, independent audited financial statement of 22nd May 2019, a signed and authenticated statute uh, they indicated the source of funding. Another document is a, an annual report, uh, 2017, and a, a strategic plan, 2019 to 2023. Uh, the analysis of uh, uh, these, uh, application uh, shows that uh, the main objectives and activities of this organization are in consonance with the, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And uh, the document are enough and uh, the file is complete to be granted the, state, uh, the observer status and I propose that the Commission uh, grants uh, these uh, observer status to the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness. That's all. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Kaitesi, uh, for um, uh, these uh, for the presentation of this application, um, highlighting uh, the various uh, documentations um, provided for purpose of supporting this application, uh, as well as the analysis uh, done on the basis of the application and the supporting documents um, on whether or not all the requirements under uh, the resolution on the granting of observer status uh, to non-governmental organizations uh, has been fulfilled. Um, from the application, uh, the legal status of the organization uh, as registered on 12 January 2012 uh, has been uh, provided and indicated there. Uh, this is an organization based in Kenya, which is a state party to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Uh, the focus of uh, and objective areas of engagement of this organization uh, are also clear enough. Uh, they deal with uh, a specific category of um, uh, groups, particularly, uh, namely women and girls. Uh, that is in accord with the uh, protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women, the Maputo Protocol. Uh, and the objectives include, uh, and the mission is basically uh, to advance women and girls uh, to enjoy full rights in dignity uh, and to champion uh, the rights of women and girls uh, to promote and protect. Uh, their rights, uh, as well as address systemic 
systematic gender inequalities, oppression, and discrimination. These are basically uh, the kinds of objectives uh, that uh, we uh, clearly see uh, articulated uh, in those terms in the Maputo Protocol on the Rights of Women. Um, and the other details relating to the statutes of the organization, uh, the source of funding, uh, annual report, uh, have also been uh, presented and provided. Uh, so the proposal, after reviewing all these documents uh, and the objectives of this organization, uh, is accordingly uh, for the Commission to grant observer status to this organization. Uh, that is the proposal. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kaitese again. Uh, do I see a hand from colleagues? Yes, uh, I see Vice Chair. Yes, Vice Chair. Indy Jamsina. Indy Jamsina, Chair. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Okay, let me give uh, Commissioner King the floor first, uh, Vice Chair. Commissioner King. Actually, I, I thought you were asking whether we, we should go ahead to grant. I just wanted to say I support the application. Uh, thank you, Commissioner King. Well noted. Uh, Vice Chair. Merci beaucoup pour la parole que vous m'accordez. Bien évidemment, je n'ai pas tous ces dossiers. Je voulais simplement demander si ce n'est pas fastidieux à la commissaire qui a été ici de, juste de nous lire un peu les objectifs, s'il vous plaît. Juste les objectifs. Comme je, OK. Euh, Commissioner Kaitese have read the objectives of the organization, uh, but if you haven't followed it, uh, I will request Commissioner Kaitese to uh, read it again. Thank you. Commissioner Kaitese. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Comme vous l'avez dit, j'avais déjà indiqué les objectifs de cette organisation. Premièrement, c'est de protéger euh, les droits de la femme et de la fille, promouvoir et actualiser les droits de la femme et de la fille, ainsi que leur liberté. Voilà. Ok, ça a le mérite d'être clair. Merci beaucoup. Uh, do I see any other uh, commissioner who may wish to? Okay, I see Commissioner Abomo, I think. Did you have your hand up, Commissioner Abomo? No? Okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, I'm checking whether I have any other uh, member of the commission uh, raising a hand. I don't see a hand up. So Commissioner King proposed uh, uh, and um, have moved for the granting of the observer status uh, of the Center for Human Rights Education and Awareness. Uh, do we have colleagues who support the motion? Okay, Commissioner Abomo. Uh, is indicating that she supports the motion for granting observer status to this organization. Colleagues, members of the commission. Okay, I, I see Commissioner uh, Moandenga as well supporting the motion. Or Commissioner Moandenga, yes, okay. Commissioner Maya as well supporting. Uh, Commissioner uh, Guy. Hello? Hello? Yes. 
Yes, we should be ending. On a Zoom meeting, can you call me later? Okay. Uh, so, uh, on the basis of the agreement, the, the, the motion for granting of observer status and the agreement of the members of the commission, uh, the commission has decided to grant observer status to the Center for Human Rights Education and Awareness. Uh, I would like to thank once again, Commissioner Kaitesi for presenting the application and the review of the commission, and would like to congratulate the Center for Human Rights Education and Awareness uh, for receiving its observer status before the African Commission. Uh, and um, I'm sure other organization that's working on the rights of women and girls, um, Commissioner, uh, it would work closely with Commissioner Kaitesi, who is the special reporter uh, of the Commission on the Rights of Women in Africa. Thank you all uh, very much uh, for uh, your uh, active um, review and analysis of these applications. Uh, we now have come to the end of this agenda item on the relationship between the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and non-governmental organizations and uh, on the relationship between the African Commission and NHRIs, as well as the three applications uh, from uh, Togo, uh, Uganda and Kenya. Uh, this uh, brings us to the end of this agenda item. Uh, as I indicated earlier on, we may come back to in the course of this session uh, to um, uh, look at if we have all the uh, necessary uh, documentations uh, that would satisfy us to the questions that uh, honorable members of the commission raised, uh, the application of uh, the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders Uganda. Uh, while that is suspended, we now come to the end of this agenda item. Uh, and we move back to uh, agenda item three, uh, which is on uh, the situation of human rights in Africa, uh, with a particular focus on uh, human and people's rights in the context of COVID-19. Uh, we have uh, a request uh, for making a statement uh, from uh, the state of Eritrea uh, and also uh, for the Honorable Dr. Nchemba, the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs of uh, Tanzania, to exercise the right of reply of Tanzania. Uh, it will. Uh, I don't think that we have confirmation on the presence of uh, the representative of the state of Eritrea at this point in time. But uh, I would like to, uh, I, Eritrea is there? Um, okay, uh, do we have Biniam, Mr. Biniam Berhe? Head of Delegation of the Permanent Mission of the State of Eritrea to the African Union and UNEC. No, what we have is Tanzania. Okay, so let me give the floor to uh, Tanzania. Uh, I think uh, uh, representing the minister uh, to exercise the right of reply of Tanzania. You have the floor, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Chairperson, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Thank you so much for giving me the floor to exercise the right of reply by the United Republic of Tanzania to the allegation made by non-governmental organization and special procedure mechanisms and agenda item number three, human rights in Africa with a special focus on human and people's rights and COVID. Mr. Chairperson, um, the United Republic of Tanzania is guided by the rule of law and advised by the principles of good governance. 
In this regard, the state addresses breach of norms, guidelines, directives, and procedures in the country by providing the right to be heard. No media house, no newspaper is arbitrarily suspended and there is due process. Furthermore, no one is above the law that there are human rights defenders, politicians, and journalists who violate the law does not absolve them from the due process. Mr. Chairman, media houses do not bro bro broadcast programs in local dialects in Tanzania. There are approximately 158 ethnic groups and our people communicate among themselves in their local dialect. However, the policy is to broadcast only in the national language, which is Kiswahili or in English. And this is a deliberate in, by design as a way of unifying the people and maintaining the peace and stability that Tanzania has acclaimed for, for, for many years. Mr. Chairman, we dispute allegations that Tanzania enacts draconian laws. An appraisal of acts referred to reveal that they are progressive and broad in their outlook with the protection of the people and journalists as their objective. There are specific aspects of this legislation which parties for their own reasons are dissatisfied with and they are challenging with sections in the court of law and the East African Court of Justice. We call upon the commission to appreciate that this is a reflective of a healthy and a dynamic justice system. Mr. Chairman, the amendments to the basic rights and duties in Enforcement Act, Cap 3, do not bar public interest litigation. What these amendments do is to clarify on the question of local standing, a cardinal principle in litigation matters, including public interest litigation. Furthermore, the amendments to the Non-Governmental Organization Act were based on recommendation in 2009 by the Eastern and Southern African anti -moundary anti-money laundering group and recommendations of financial action task force, an independent intergovernmental body that, de that develops and pro promotes policies to protect the global financial system against money laundering, terrorist financing, and the financing of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Mr. Chairman, we have great confidence in, the, in our institutions, including the National Electoral Commission, which coordinates the electoral process for parliamentary and presidential elections. The NEC derives its autonomy from the Constitution of the United Republic of Tanzania, 1977, and executes its mandate effectively. We see no reasons to disrupt this, this existing mechanism. National elections are scheduled for October 2020 and the preparations are underway. Mr. Chairman, the government of the United Republic of Tanzania had certain expectations when it deposited its declaration under Article 34.6 of the protocol. It was expected that the reservation made in, in, in its declaration would be respected and adhered to by the African Court on Human and People's Rights when appraising applications filed by individuals and non-governmental organizations. However, the reality is that decisions of the Honorable Court, among other matters, are contrary to state policy and cannot be implemented at this stage. We also dispute the allegations that non-governmental organizations and individuals cannot access the court, as what we have done is to revert to the system that was in place prior for applicants to access the court through the African Commission of Human and People's Rights. Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, we wish to reaffirm our commitment to the spirit and the mandate of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, and we shall continue to meet our obligations to promote and protect the human, right, the human and people's rights of our people. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much uh, for uh, exercising your right of reply, uh, Madam. Uh, on behalf of the United Republic of Tanzania, uh, we are 
uh, happy to listen to the explanations uh, given, uh, the clarifications offered with respect to uh, various issues that have been raised in the course of our deliberations uh, on, during this session. Uh, I think one of the things that I would wish to say at this point is uh, for purpose of uh, obviously the African Commission, uh, for uh, a number of years now, we have been requesting uh, Tanzania to grant us uh, uh, an authorization for us to undertake a mission to Tanzania. Uh, such a mission would help us for us to uh, firsthand see for ourselves as members of the Commission uh, the state of human rights in Tanzania and to engage in a constructive dialogue uh, with all uh, human rights stakeholders in Tanzania, including non-governmental organizations, uh, members of the media, uh, national human rights institution, as well as uh, the various um, uh, state institutions of Tanzania. Uh, we still place this uh, request of the commission uh, to you, madam, uh, and through you uh, to the uh, Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs of Tanzania. Uh, this engagement is extremely important uh, for us as the Commission uh, in exercising and discharging our mandate uh, of monitoring uh, the state of human rights uh, in state parties and also uh, in clarifying uh, to our satisfaction uh, the various issues that have been raised, particularly in respect to you know, freedom of expression and the media. Uh, these concerns are brought to our attention very repeatedly and on a number of occasions we have raised it ourselves uh, through uh, letters of urgent appeal or uh, statements that we have issued uh, and also uh, challenges affecting uh, the civic space uh, as well as uh, the operation of uh, opposition um, uh, political parties uh, including members of parliament particularly in the context of covid uh, so we look forward to your uh, continuous uh, engagement with us, uh, but also uh, your positive response to our request for us to uh, undertake a visit uh, to the United Republic of Tanzania. Thanks so much once again. Do we have uh, the representative of the state of Eritrea? I have no indication to that effect. Uh, we have a request from an international uh, organization uh, with which uh, the Commission, within the framework of Article 45 of the Charter, um, engages in collaborative work, and this is the International Committee of the Red Cross. If we have the representative of the International Committee of the Red Cross with us, uh, I would like to request that uh, the representative takes the floor to make the statement on behalf of the ICRC. Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good afternoon. Morning. Good morning from Dakar. <laughs> uh, Excellency Mr. Solomon Dresso, Chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Honorable Commissioners, distinguished representatives of state parties, distinguished representatives of national human rights institutions and civil society organizations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we would first of all like to express our support to the African Union member states in their ongoing fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. We commend the ACHPR for its recent statements, recommendations and reminders to member states on the specificities and risk for most vulnerable people. It is clear that populations and institutions are being hit hard by the COVID-19 and its attendant measures and lockdowns, which they come on the top of pre-existing shocks caused by armed conflict, violence, and climate change. In contexts such as Burkina Faso, Mali, South Sudan, Mozambique, and Nigeria, to name few, conflicts have continued and in some cases escalated despite the pandemic. Tens of thousands of people have been forcibly displaced in recent months across Africa and homes and livelihoods destroyed. Health care facilities have also been looted and destroyed, leaving communities with no access to medical care amid a global pandemic. While we note that health responses are important, 
vital, we stress also that COVID responses need to mitigate wider secondary impacts. And in this regard, we consider respect for international humanitarian law, humanitarian principles and human rights to be important components of COVID response. On international displaced and refugees, Africa hosts about 27 million refugees and internally displaced people. For example, in Burkina Faso, the number of people displaced by violence increased by more than 1,200% to about 765,000 people since 2019. Internally displaced people are at particular risk of COVID infection. They live in overcrowding camps, and host settlements where they cannot practice physical distancing nor have access to hygiene measures. IDPs are disproportionately impacted by the economic repercussions of lockdown measures given their precarious circumstances, and many of them depend heavily on humanitarian assistance or on the support of the host communities. And while we recognize the need for the appropriate use of restrictions such as physical and social distancing, closure of non-essential services, quarantine and other containment efforts, are life-saving measures necessary in the attempt to curtail the spread of, of COVID-19, but we believe that this will probably be the most devastating and long-term consequence of COVID for internally displaced people. It is therefore the ICRC's view that the COVID-19 containment measures are imposed, authorities need to prepare and or allow for alternate methods of delivering assistance and providing these services to IDPs, refugees and host communities in conditions that protect the health of both IDPs and the staff involved. On migrants, stringent measures restricting the mobility of people across borders make migrants, including refugees and others in need of international protection, become vulnerable, whether in transit or in destination countries. In this respect, the ICRC welcomes the African Union recent appeal to preserve the right of migrants, including refugees, as containing the international human rights law and international refugee law, while adopting measures that restrict the mobility of people. The ICRC particularly commends the African Union's call to states to enhance solidarity and cooperation on repatriation of migrants and caution on the impact of mass deportations on the situation of migrants and capacity of countries of origin to safely manage the influx of people in manners that allow for adequate public health measures. On detainees, there are about 1.1 million detainees in Africa they often are forgotten. They are, remain invisible to the outside world, but prisons and other places of detention need to be included in all COVID-related contingency plans of national and local authorities, taking into account their specificities, their specific characteristics, and this is urgent. Although habitual activities in places of detention may be subject to change during the crisis, basic human needs must be met. Family contact, adequate accommodation, hygiene, food and access to health care must be guaranteed. When authorities take measures to respond to COVID-19 in detention, they should minimize their impact on detainees' rights and preserve their dignity. Prior trial detention should be avoided whenever possible, and alternative measures should be given serious consideration. Immigration detention should also be a last resort. Serious consideration should be given to closing or empty detention facilities that are inadequate for the control of the infection, and appropriate management of COVID-19 cases. Such closure should be accompanied by all necessary measures to facilitate the inclusion and integration of those related release into the society. We recognize, however, the very positive mitigation measures taken by some countries who have implemented early release of detainees, expedited the judicial processes and put in place telephone services to enable detainees to remain connected with the families. Last point is on the use of force in law enforcement operations. As COVID-19 crisis has evolved, military and security forces have been used in some contexts to support confinement measures. There have been incidents of excess of use of force across the continent by security forces as measures aimed at preventing the spread of COVID-19. Law enforcement officials must, as far as possible, use non-violent means before resorting to the use of force and firearms of other weapons. Lastly, the scale and possible consequences of COVID-19 pandemic represent an unprecedented challenge for every society. Exceptional efforts are required of governments and it will take all actors, national and international, working together to deal with this situation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your statement uh, on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, 
highlighting specifically, uh, we join you in expressing uh, support to the efforts of states, uh, parties, to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights uh, in seeking to uh, contain the spread of COVID-19. Um, we also take note of and indeed express uh, our concern ex in expressing our concern uh, about conflict situations uh, in the Sahel, uh, in parts of Horn of Africa, uh, in the Lake Chad Basin uh, regions of the continent, as well as in the uh, northern part of Mozambique, uh, which have led to a large number of displacements, uh, the loss of life, uh, as well as uh, refugees as well. Uh, these are indeed issues of very serious concern uh, that compound uh, the fight against COVID-19 um, and making it uh, impossible for some sections of society to have uh, the necessary uh, protection measures from COVID-19. Uh, the issues affecting uh, IDPs, refugees uh, and migrants uh, have also been noted. Uh, we also take note of the 1.1 million detainees on the African continent who on account of uh, congestion of uh, prisons and place of detention uh, face a major risk of uh, contracting the virus. Uh, indeed, at the African Commission, uh, we have been urging states, parties to the African Charter to release uh, those who are detained on account of uh, petty offenses and those who have served um, a reasonable amount of their time in prison uh, so that uh, there is uh, social distancing could be observed in place of detention and in uh, place of uh, prisons. Um, we also, of course, uh, join you in urging member states to continue to do the releasing of uh, those who are detained, uh, particularly those for petty offenses, uh, and add, or to put in place alternative uh, spaces uh, where people can be protected from COVID. Um, I think the various measures put in place, including the provision of tele, uh, telephone services to enable um, those in place of detention and in pre prison inmates to remain connected with their families uh, is uh, a best, uh, best practice that should be replicated by uh, all member states. Uh, we join you also in insisting that uh, using uh, arrest and detention as well as use of force for purpose of enforcing COVID-19 uh, regulations should be a last resort, a very, very last resort. Uh, it is through uh, persuasion and through awareness raising that the COVID-19 response measures should be uh, enforced, not through the use of force, not through detention. Uh, some of the reports that we have uh, of uh, states detaining hundreds of thousands of uh, people for breaching COVID-19 response measures would go contrary to uh, the effort to contain the virus, since such large number of arrests and detention would lead to congestion of place of detention. Uh, so we really sometimes find it difficult to understand why we need to even deploy military uh, forces, uh, including with tanks. I mean, this is not a conflict situation. Um, you know, some of the places like Madagascar, where I saw a military tank as part of the deployment of the military to contain uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, it's difficult to understand why there is a need for such kind of actions. We thank you once again for your statement, uh, highlighting very important issues uh, that need to be addressed uh, and also some best, uh, uh, best practices. If we, if, I don't think that there is still an indication on the presence of the representative of the state of Eritrea. Uh, so I would go to uh, the request from 
national human rights institutions. Uh, we have a request uh, from the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria. And if we have the representative of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria with us, uh, we, would, we would be happy to take the statement of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria. Uh, I understand represented by the chairperson of the commission. Uh, some of us, uh, including myself, have been following the work of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria uh, in, the in the context of COVID-19. Um, really a very commendable work that they have been doing du during this very difficult time. I'm not sure if we have Etwell, do we have the representative of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria? Yes, uh, thank you very much. The chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Dr. Solomon Daso. Honorable members of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and other state representatives representatives of the African Union, representatives of the regional economic communities, representatives of national human rights institutions, representatives of the non-governmental organizations, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria, I wish to thank the chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights for inviting us to address the 66th ordinary session of the African Commission. I also commend the African Commission for considering it important to hold this virtual session despite the difficult times imposed on us by the COVID-19 pandemic. It shows the commitment of the African Commission to ensuring the promotion and protection of human rights even in the most challenging moments. I take this moment to congratulate the commissioners of the African Commission for their appointment and to this highest rights office on the continent. In a special way, I'm happy also to give the report of the activities of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria during the COVID-19 period. It has been quite a challenging period. Immediately, um, the, the country um, decided to uh, pass COVID-19 regulations to uh, regulate the COVID-19 period. Of course, we know that during period of emergencies like this, uh, some aspects of human rights will be affected. So we quickly issued an advisory uh, to the citizens uh, to expect um, that some of the rights will be restricted in the interest of public safety, public health, and public um, concern. Of course, we also anticipated that from the antecedents of our law enforcement officers, that there was likelihood that they will they will use uh, draconian measures to enforce the lockdown. Now, we are apprehensive of the fact that because of the nature of COVID-19 pandemic, it will be difficult for the commission to monitor the implementation and enforcement of COVID-19 regulations in Nigeria through physical means. We therefore quickly deployed electronic means to monitor human rights violations across the country during the enforcement of COVID-19 regulations. We partner with civil society members and members of the public. We partner with development partners and developed a mechanical way, an electronic way to monitor human rights violations across the country. At the various stages of the lockdown, the commission recorded the following number of human rights violations. The first two weeks, there were 105 violations and eight were on extrajudicial killings. 33 were on torture, inhuman, and degrading treatment. 27 was on violation of the right to freedom of movement, unlawful arrest and detention. 19 was on lawful seizure, confiscation of properties. 13 violations on extortion. Four violations on sexual and gender-based violence. And one violation on discrimination in the distribution of COVID-19 related items. The next week, the next, because the, 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 the regulations we are, you know, made in batches of two, two weeks implementation. The next two weeks of implementation, we noticed extrajudicial killings had increased to 11. Law enforcement officers had killed another 11 persons while trying to enforce the lockdown. 
Torture, inhuman and degrading treatment reported were 34. The violation of right to freedom of movement, unlawful arrest and detention was 14. Unlawful seizure, confiscation of properties was 11. Extortion was 19. Sexual and gender-based violence was 15. Now, it was on record that as at that date, as at the second batch of monitoring of violations, only 11 Nigerians had died as a result of COVID-19. But the law enforcement agents had killed 19 citizens while trying to enforce the COVID-19. And by the time the commission came out with this report, uh, it opened the eyes of the authorities to the, um, to the way our law enforcement officers were enforcing uh, the COVID-19 regulations. And this elicited a national opera and a call for the law enforcement officers to treat the, the citizens with human dignity. And we now engage the government and uh, with the COVID-19, uh, uh, the, the presidential tax force on COVID-19, the commission engaged them and it was agreed that the commission will forward all these complaints against each and every member of the law enforcement agents so that they will give an account of the accountability measures they had taken to deal with all the officers who were involved in this. Three months was given to them. As it is now, we are monitoring them. We are uh, interacting with them to give us a, a report on what they had done to hold all the officers who were involved in these violations to account. Now, during the COVID-19, we noticed some trend in the area of sexual and gender-based violence. We noticed that this was um, now um, affecting the numbers of cases of uh, SDBV, rape, domestic violence that was being reported to the commission. When we noticed this, we now raised a national campaign along with other stakeholders to raise awareness about the, the, the exponential rise in the number of uh, SDBV cases across the country. And uh, we embarked a, on a one week of activism. This one week of activism was to raise awareness and uh, sensitization on SDBV around the country. The National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria has offices in the 36 states of the country. So each of the office in the 36 states embarked on one week of activism. And this entailed uh, visiting all the stakeholders and sensitizing them on the uh, uh, pandemic of sexual and gender-based violence. We organized TV and radio programs on sexual and gender-based violence. And during the one week, the commission partnered with the Nigerian police force and the Ni National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons the Nigerian Bar Association and the Federation of Female Lawyers to campaign along the streets with banners and placards to condemn rape, domestic violence, and other forms of HGDV to create awareness around issues on HGDV. And stakeholders visited during the one week of activism include the following. We visited the Attorney General of the Federation to campaign for positive amendments to existing laws and policies to stem st stigmatization and ease prosecution of rape and other SDBV cases. The campaign went to the Minister of Information to join forces in awareness and sensitization on national call for action and declaration of state of emergency on rape and other forms of SDBV by the commission. The campaign went to the Minister of Women Affairs to join forces with the commission to fight for the restoration of dignity of womanhood in Nigeria. The campaign further went to the chief judge of the federal high court to solicit for the support of the judiciary to ensure quick handling of HDBV cases and to bring quick justice to victims and survivors of rape and other forms of HDBV. The campaign of the commission took us to the National Assembly asking them to collaborate with the commission and CSOs to ensure that human rights is mainstreamed into all legislations, especially on rape and other forms of SDBV. It is worthy to note that since after the visit to the National Assembly to sensitize them on SDBV, two positive legislations have been passed, thereby improving the climate for the prosecution of rape and other forms of SDBV cases in Nigeria. These two cases are, there was an act of the National Assembly to prohibit 
to be to prohibit and redress sexual harassment of students in tertiary ins educational institutions and for matters concerned there with 2019. There was also an amendment to the Penal and Criminal Codes Act Cap C38 of Laws of the Federation of Nigeria 200 and 2004. This amendment has the following far reaching effects. The removal of statute of limitation for the prosecution of the offenses of rape and defilement. The amendment in definition of rape to bring it into conformity with the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act 2019 and to make such definition applicable to cases prosecuted at the federal high courts. And thirdly, the removal of gender restrictions on the offense of rape, et cetera, et cetera. And this, is a mono, this has brought monumental changes to the climate for the prosecution of cases of rape and sexual and gender-based violence because it has always been difficult uh, to, to prosecute and make convictions on cases of rape and sexual and gender-based violence. At the 36 states of the country, the State Office of the National Human Rights Commission visited state governor's wives, the Speaker of the State House of Assembly, the State Commissioners of Police, the Chief Judge of the States, the leaders of the Christian and Muslim worshippers, the Honorable Attorney General of the States, all preaching on end to stigmatization on rape and other forms of SGBV and accountability for rape and SGBV offenses. It is worthy to note that the Commission also facilitated a high level policy dialogue with the vice president and development partners on the issue of rape and SDV in Nigeria. The commission formed a strategic partnership with the Nigerian police force and NAPTIC, which are the agencies that prosecute offenses of rape and SDV. The focus of this partnership is to train them and improve their capacity to deal with the prosecutorial and psychological challenges in handling SDV cases. It had been discovered that the attitude, of, the attitude of prosecuting agencies towards victims and survivors had contributed in the past to not reporting or withdrawal from prosecution of complaints by victims and survivors. Furthermore, it was discovered that most of the COVID-19 patients were complaining of violation of their rights. The commission, after studying the situation, developed an advisory on minimum standards for the treatment of COVID-19 patients. While the details are contained on the website of the commission, the highlights include the removal of stigmatization from patients by renaming the holding facility to treatment centers rather than calling them isolation centers. The preservation of the right to privacy of laboratory or test results or medical records. The right to communication, mental health of the patients as well as protection of medical personnel through adequate personal protection equipment. It is of interest that this advisory has been commended and welcomed by the National Center for Disease Control and has proposed to partner with the commission to monitor the protection of rights of COVID-19 patients using templates of the minimum standards developed by the commission. The commission is presently co collaborating with its partners to operationalize the national call for action on SDBV and rape surge during COVID-19 period. Actions outlined include the following. Establishment of a situation room on sexual and gender-based violence. Establishment of a national emergency toll-free call number and call center on SDBV and rape. Electronic monitoring of human rights violations of COVID-19 patients, rape and SDBV and human rights violations in general during COVID-19 period and thereafter. Other activities on the protection of human rights during COVID-19 pandemic include the organization of a sensitization and awareness webinar in collaboration with the Network of African National Human Rights Institutions for African NHRIs on protection of human rights in COVID-19 era, as well as the role of NHRIs in combating rape and SGBV in the COVID-19 era. The commission has also partnered with Global Alliance for the Network of National Human Rights Institutions to conduct a webinar on rights of older persons during the COVID-19 period. The commission is presently holding a virtual and sensitization and awareness creation on access to water as a fundamental human right, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is in view of the protocol and other sanitation requirements for COVID-19 management. In conclusion, the commission wishes to congratulate the organizers of the 66th session to put this virtual meeting in place despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
COVID-19 has presented enormous challenges for promotion and protection of human rights in Africa, and there cannot be a better time to discuss and partner to move the continent forward than now. I want to thank the chairperson and all the members and all the participants at this 66 session. Thank you, and wish you the best from Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anthony uh, Ojoko, uh, the chairperson of the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria, for that very detailed and comprehensive uh, report on the activities undertaken by the National Human Rights Commission of Nigeria, particularly in the context of COVID-19. Uh, I would like to commend uh, you for your leadership, uh, but also uh, the commission. Uh, for rising to the challenge that COVID-19 has posed to all members of the human rights family uh, in the context of COVID-19. Uh, we have Thank come you. to realize uh, that it is actually in a context like this one, uh, that we need to have more action on the part of human rights actors for the promotion and protection of human rights. These are times that require more engagement to ensure that the actions taken by states uh, and other actors do not lead to the erosion of the gains that have been made in the promotion and protection of human rights uh, and the creation of conditions uh, for further violations of rights. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, the strategies that you have deployed, uh, particularly in terms of uh, following the uh, measures that have been adopted at the national level that makes it impossible to physically monitor uh, the uh, COVID-19 regulations, the adoption of electronic means of monitoring. I think that's uh, the same kind of approach that other organizations have taken as well. Um, the partnering with other civil society organizations uh, in the monitoring of uh, rights and also the reporting uh, that you have uh, published uh, in the various weeks, uh, in the two weeks time, uh, the first two weeks, uh, the second two weeks, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, which have led to uh, raising awareness about uh, a very uh, concerning trend of violations of rights that have emerged in the context, in the context of the enforcement of COVID-19 regulations uh, affecting a wide range of human rights, uh, ranging from the right to life, uh, to freedom from torture, uh, to uh, the rights of uh, women, particularly to be protected from and to be free from any form of violence, particularly gender-based and sexual violence, uh, extortion uh, and uh, unlawful seizure and confiscation of property, uh, particularly, uh, uh, excessive use of force, and all of these affecting most, mostly, it is the poor and the most uh, vulnerable that have been affected by the uh, violations. Um, and your work have led to uh, not only raising awareness, but also importantly, in uh, bringing about amendment to two existing laws uh, that have paved the way for uh, creating conducive environment for effective prosecution of uh, sexual and gender-based violence uh, in Nigeria uh, through the action of the national parliament. Uh, we also take note of your advisory on the rights of COVID-19 patients and health workers, uh, as well as the effective strategies that you have deployed uh, in reaching out uh, particularly to both national as well as federal, uh, state, and non-state actors uh, by declaring sexual and gender-based violence as a pandemic uh, that have emerged in the context of the health pandemic. Uh, this is an issue for not just Nigeria, but also all of the continent. And we uh, urge uh, your continued uh, and sustained engagement uh, in these matters. Uh, and we are happy at the African Commission to amplify uh, the uh, productive and effective work that you are undertaking 
and also uh, to urge other NHRIs to uh, follow the example that we have said uh, in this respect. Thank you once again for that statement. We have now come to uh, the back time uh, for today's session. As we go for a health break, I would like to uh, notify uh, members of the commission and participants uh, on uh, a feedback that I have received from the secretariat of the commission regarding uh, the file uh, on the application for observer status from the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders of Uganda. I have been informed by the Secretariat that uh, the application file for the National Coalition of Human Rights of, uh, Defenders of Uganda uh, doesn't have sufficient information to respond to questions raised by commissioners. Uh, on the basis of this, uh, the proposal, uh, which I agree with, is therefore that uh, the Secretariat uh, makes the necessary request to uh, the National Coalition of Human Rights Defenders Uganda to provide additional information. Uh, based on that, uh, the application would be considered during the next organization of the Commission. With that, I would like to once again thank uh, the members of uh, the Commission, uh, Excellencies, representatives of state parties, uh, national human rights institutions, international organizations, and civil society organizations, my colleagues, my colleagues at the Secretariat and our interpreters for your work and kind attention as well as participation. Uh, we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>